Okay. Blessings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're continuing in Romans chapter 6, but let's go back to Romans chapter 6, verse 1, and we'll try to resume where we left off, but we want to put it in the overall context of the chapter. So we go back to verse 1 of Romans 6, please, and I will read it. Please read along with me. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Um, this, of course, relates to something that we're going to see that, that follows at beginning in verse 13. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. In order that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, and that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Remember, if you are a saved, born-again believer, who has had believer's baptism, your funeral is a past event. Your funeral is a past event. Your death is a past event. There is no death. There is only life. What is death to unsaved people is sleep to us, is sleep to us. Not soul sleep, but a sleep of the body. <clears throat> it is sleep to us. No death, only life. No giving up the ghost in the sense unsaved people do. We give up the ghost unto life, not unto death. Biological cessation is simply going to sleep. Two words for death, Thanos and Necros in Greek. There's no Thanos. We died with Christ. We were buried with him in baptism. We raise with him by faith. There is no Thanos for us. Unsaved people have Thanos. All we have is a temporary necros. Necros. We get the medical term necrosis, a death of tissue. Okay? There's a temporary necrosis. But there is no Thanos and no permanent necrosis. There is no death. There is only life. There is sleep. But there is no death your funeral has already taken place. You've already died. <clears throat> Hence, when we consider biological life and biological death in these things, our perspective is completely different from the perspective of the world, from the perspective of unsaved people, <clears throat> okay? Their troubles begin at the grave, ours end there, okay? All of their hopes <clears throat> end at the grave. All of our hopes really begin there okay our troubles end there their trouble begins there it is completely different for us and them they have a hearse and a co coffin waiting for them <coughs> we merely have a sleeping bag okay that's all we need to understand to have a biblical perspective of biological death as believers that is different than the world. Necros, temporarily. Thanos, none at all. Okay. Funeral, we already had the funeral. Okay. It's over. Okay. Now, the main subject of the chapter, however, is not baptism, even though it relates to it. It includes some of the Bible's teaching on baptism. So we're only dealing with it in the light of the context of the chapter. Now, don't continue to sin. The sinner is dead. He was crucified. She was crucified with Christ. Let's move down. <clears throat> for the death that he died, he died to sin, in verse 10, once and for all. Hence, we died to sin once and for all. In my own case, it was drug addiction. Other people's, it's other things. 
as we looked at, believers may stumble, but they don't continue to live that way. If they do, they were either never saved to begin with or they're backslidden. We don't continue to live as zombies, as corpses. The old creation is dead. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Therefore, do not let sin <clears throat> reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts. This is not to say we will not struggle with it, but it is to say it will not reign. The power of sin reigns in the life of unsaved people. When somebody is not born again, the throne of their life <clears throat> is occupied by sin. Sin is their master. Sin is their master. Okay. <clears throat> Christ is on our throne. Christ is on our throne. Okay. Just think of two thrones, two dominions, two domains. With unsaved people, <clears throat> sin reigns. With us, Christ reigns. Okay. Them, death awaits. For us, life awaits. Let's look. Verse 13, do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Now, obviously, this could have a clear sexual connotation. It could have a clear connotation about sexual sin, but it's by no means limited to that. Now, let's look at verse 14. Sin shall not be master over you. You're not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? May it never be. Okay. <clears throat> verse 15 and verse 1 go together. Verse 15 and verse 1 go together. Verse 1 of this chapter introduces this subject. Ver verse 15 uh, climaxes the theme of this chapter. What shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may be increased? Verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace may it never be? Remember, the law shows we have sin. It imputes sin. We are under the law of sin and death until we come under the law of Christ. Now, look again at that verse. Fourteen, sin shall not be master over you. Turn with me, please, back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 4. Let's begin in verse 11. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Remember, Abel is a type of Christ, what the acceptable sacrifice. Cain is a picture of fallen man. When you cultivate the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. You shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Notice the consequences of the sin of Adam are now multiplied in Cain and his sons, his offspring. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. Behold, thou hast driven me this day from the face of the ground and from thy face. I shall be hidden and I shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and it will come about that whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. 
And the Lord appointed the sign for Cain, lest anyone finding him should slay him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Okay. Now, what did God tell Cain when the Lord confronted him uh, about the death of Abel? We're told his countenance fell. But in verse 7, look at verse 7 very carefully. God tells Cain something now. Okay, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? Because of his sin and his murder of Abel, his countenance fell. Because of our sin and the murder of Jesus, our countenance as fallen man fell. But if you do well, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Notice you must master sin. Its desire is for you. You must master it. Its desire is for you. Go ahead now to Romans, once again, chapter 6. Verse 14, sin shall not be master over you. Romans 6.14 goes straight back to the seventh verse of Genesis 4. Okay. There's two thrones. Either Jesus is going to be on the throne as the master or sin is. The result of one will be life. The result of the other will be death. Cain replays the sin of Adam and goes even further with it into murdering Abel. Yet even there, the Lord holds out a hope for him. Okay. The Lord holds out a hope for him. God holds out a hope for fallen man, despite the fact that we caused Jesus to be killed. The one who bought the acceptable sacrifice, Abel, was hated by the one who bought the unacceptable sacrifice, is a tiller of the field, his own deeds, his own work, his own, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Abel, knowing this, brought the acceptable sacrifice, the shedding of blood, Cain did not. The world, unsaved people, people who have any other idea of salvation based on their own works or efforts are always going to hate true Christians. They're going to want to murder true Christians the way that Cain murdered Jesus. The ones who have the acceptable sacrifice are going to be hated by the ones who don't. Yet in his mercy, God holds out a hope even for Cain. Oh, you're going to wander east of Eden. <laughs> and you're going to have a lot of trouble. And the, world, the planet itself is going to be under a curse. Now this idea of the planet itself being under a curse that you see in Genesis 4 we will see in a few weeks, Lord willing, that concept is addressed in Romans chapter 8. The idea of the, the planet, the biosphere being under a curse, that comes back up again in Romans also, in Romans 8. Hence, Genesis shows the fall of man. Romans shows the way of, explains the way of salvation. Romans explains the gospel clearer than any other book in the, in, in the scripture. Okay. So, verse 14 directly connects with Genesis 4, 7. Do you not know when you present yourselves to someone as a slave for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death, or of obedience resulting in life. But thanks to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. Having been free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Now let's understand this idea. The Greek word is dolos. 
if you were to read the Torah carefully, God did not allow the institution of slavery for his people. It was not allowed. There was indenturism. If somebody lost their land uh, to debt and things like this, they could have to go into the service of the person who held the debt until the year of Jubilee and repay it. And their land could be used by the person who held their debt to recover their losses. But in the year of Jubilee, the land would have to be repatriated to the family to whom it belonged, to whom God gave it in the apportionment of Joshua. There were no foreclosures. You could not lose your land permanently. It had to go back to the ones to whom God gave it. So too, you could not lose your freedom permanently. There was an indenture. And when the indenture was over, at the year of Jubilee, you would be free. And during the indenture, you had rights. If you knocked out the tooth of a bond servant, they'd be free before the indenture ended, before the year of Jubilee. They can go free if you knock their tooth out. You couldn't mistreat them. You had to look upon them as fellow countrymen and so forth. They had rights. There are many things in common between other ancient legal codes, such as the Code of Hammurabi and the Torah. Many things in common. <coughs> but there were things that were <coughs> unique about the Torah as a constitution, <coughs> sorry, as a constitution and a legislation that were different than other bodies of law from the ancient world. One was everything was predicated on monotheism, the one true God, and the relationship with him. Okay. The Greeks had, they, the, the Egyptians had had that concept, but they had Ra. Their God was Ra. <laughs> okay. And they were polytheistic. Um, you can read the Psalms of Osiris, and almost word for word, it's the same as the Psalms of David, except they're giving glory and worship to other gods. <laughs> The idea of being the son of God, well, <laughs> wait a minute. The, the Romans had that with, with, with Caesar, but the Egyptians had that. They believed Pharaoh was the son of God. There was always a satanic counterfeit even before Jesus. Okay. So you have these other laws in other countries. But with the Hebrews, the first thing that set the Torah apart was... It was all predicated on monotheism and the worship of the one true God, Yahweh. Second, the Hebrews had a much higher standard of public health, social justice, and education. Literacy in the rest of the ancient world was, of course, the domain of the nobility, of royalty, of military commanders, and pagan priesthoods. The Levites were to make sure every Jew could read the Torah. <laughs> you had to be able to read the Torah to practice the faith of the Hebrew scriptures. Widespread literacy. When the New Testament says they perceive the apostles were not educated men, they were not educated by the standards of the Jewish world. But they were fairly well educated compared to much of the pagan world, where 25% of the the population was slaves, and illiteracy was widespread. The Jews did not allow illiteracy. Liter illiteracy was against the law. Okay. Uh, it's a strange kind of situation. But in the aftermath of the American Civil War, when they had Jim Crow, they tried to perpetuate the institution of slavery in the American South. The Democratic Party tried to perpetuate slavery with another name. Instead of slaves, it was chain gangs, arresting blacks for petty crimes and things like this. But also, um, they, they had gun control. They didn't want blacks to be able to defend themselves from the Ku Klux Klan, so they wanted gun control. 
Okay. But they also didn't want blacks to be able to read, and they made laws against literacy, teaching blacks to read. They wanted a black population that was illiterate um, or certainly uneducated. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, today they do the same thing. They have a school system, you know, designed to fail. In the United States, the school system is designed to fail, particularly to fail the minorities and make an underclass. They don't want charter schools or anything like that. Well, they're just doing what they always did. These things you see today, these injustices perpetrated against blacks and minorities in the United States, and I'm not politically polemicizing here, I'm just making the comparison. These things were completely, completely antithetical even to the Old Testament. Even to the Old Testament, these policies were antithetical. God did not allow it even under the Old Covenant. He did not allow these things such as illiteracy. He did not want ignorance. He did not want illiteracy. He just didn't want it. <clears throat> also, there was the year of Jubilee. Uh, you can go free. When could a slave go free? So the American model of slavery of the Democratic Party, uh, Jim Crow and so forth, their model of slavery was not like the biblical one. Their model of slavery was like the world's, like the pagan one. Even though they were all good Southern Baptists and nice Calvinists and Southern Methodists, and, and they were Calvinists, uh, and, and they had slavery. Uh, while claiming to be, they all went to church and everything, but what they were doing was completely contrary to scripture. Uh, it was contrary even to the Old Testament, much less the new, where Paul said, if you can get free, get free. Or if you have a slave, you got to treat him like family, like a brother. You can't, you know, <laughs> this was the theme of, 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 of the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, by Harriet Beecher Stowe, who was a believer, the abolitionist authoress, whose family were Christians. The father was a was a, was an evangelical preacher. Uh, you you understand? They follow the world's ideas of slavery. God did not allow that for Israel, much less for the church. So, how do we understand this? Two models of slavery are being contrasted in Romans. We might say Satan's version and God's version. God's version, however, is better translated bond servant ship. Bond servant ship. The world's is simply Slavery in the conventional sense. You are my property. God said, no, these are my people. They're my property. Bond servantship. Now, how do we understand the difference between these two models of slavery that Paul is comparing? Okay. Under God's model of bond servantship, At the year of Jubilee, at Passover time, if a bond servant, a dolos, a bond slave, it was a temporary slavery. But if they were in the service of a benevolent master, who would have been actually, in, in modern terminology, an employer, the, the, the ancient languages didn't make that kind of distinction. Okay, just a ball, master, or, or, or uh, you know, of Lord Kurios in Greek. They didn't have those distinctions we have now between master and employer. Okay. If you worked for a good guy, he treated you and your family well. He took care of you, and you chose to remain in his service voluntarily of your own volition because you had a pretty good life. And it would have been easier doing that than striking out on your own. Okay. You had that option. 
It's like saying, well, at the year of Jubilee, you can go free. And we can give you a stipend and maybe a, 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 a donkey or something like that in 40 acres. And you can go out and try to make it on your own. Good luck. But it's down to you. If things don't work out for you, that's still down to you. However, if you continue to work for me, we will guarantee that you will have the necessities of life. <laughs> So you could opt to remain in bond servantship. The way I would compare this is the following. It is like a military enlistment. Britain is similar to America, but I'll use the American model. The U.S. Constitution only partially applies to those in the military. You give up certain rights. It's called the Uniform Code of Military Justice. In the civilian world, you can't be charged twice for the same crime. In the military, you can. If more evidence comes to light and they find that, it's different. However, you enlist and you re-enlist. At the year of Jubilee, instead of going free, you choose to re-enlist. I'm responsible for your medical, for your dental plan, for your family, for your pension. I'm responsible for this, this, this. Okay. It is contractual. An enlistment is contractual. You are guaranteed certain things by the Pentagon, by the Veterans Administration. You are guaranteed certain things by the Veterans Administration and the Department of Defense. But you're in the Army, or you're in the Navy, or you're in the Air Force, or you're in the Marines, or the Space Force, or whatever it is. You like Germany? Yeah, good. Well, we're transferring you from Germany to Okinawa. <laughs> You have no say in it. Oh, you like Japan? Yeah. Well, we're transferring you back to the States. You like Kansas? No. Well, you're going there anyway. That's the nature of the military. You've given up certain rights. You cannot make certain decisions concerning yourself. You have given those things up. But it was voluntary. Nobody forced you to re-enlist, okay? Well, think of God's version of bond servantship as that. It is a voluntary re-enlistment. They would drive a gold nail through the earlobe of the slave into a doorpost, and that would be a way to sign the re-enlistment contract. I want to stay permanently in your service. Or, like saying, I want a permanent military career. I realize what I'm giving up, and I realize what I'm gaining. Okay. Well, let's go further with this now. God's model is we could say contractual if we wanted to put it in modern terminology. God's model of bond servantship is based on covenant. The world's model, Satan's kingdom's model of slavery is not based on covenant. It is based on captivity. God's model of slavery, if you want to use the term bond servantship, God's model is based on covenant. I'll make a covenant. We'll cut a covenant. We'll have a contract. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. Contract. Covenant. God's model is covenant. Satan's model, the world's model, captivity. Every unsaved person is making bricks for Pharaoh. 
Secondly, secondly, the boss, the one on the throne, is Satan. Unsaved people are making bricks for Pharaoh. They're serving Pharaoh. They're serving the God of this world. And God's model of bond servantship, Christ is on the throne. Okay. In the world's model of slavery, okay, the result is going to be death. Sin reigns. The wages of sin is death. Sin is on that throne. The slavery of the world will lead only to death. Bond servantship to Christ will lead to life. We might say that what Romans chapter 6 is doing is comparing slavery to bond servantship. <laughs> slavery the devil, bond servantship, the Lord. Slavery, sin is on the throne. Bond servantship, righteousness reigns. Slavery is based on captivity. Bond servantship is based on covenant. The end result of slavery, death. The end result of bond servantship, life. It's like the Bob Dylan song. You got to serve somebody. It might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. Well, he was theologically, doctrinally, he was absolutely right in those lyrics. You got to serve somebody. Unsaved people might think they're free. No, they're not. They're in bondage to sin. They may not accept it, but when they die, they'll find out what its wages are. They're so deceived, they don't know they're slaves. He who commits sin is slave to sin. They're so deceived, they don't know they are slaves. I was a slave to illegal drugs before Jesus set me free. I was enslaved. By the grace of God, I chose Christ because he chose me. It was a covenant. Now I'm free. Which boss you want to work for? That's the question. Who do you want on the throne? Which boss do you want to work for? But you're going to work for one or the other. Doesn't matter if you don't believe it now. You're going to believe it when you give up the ghost. You're going to believe it on payday. Payday. A payday is coming. The slaves... Their wages is going to be death. The bond servants, by the grace of God, our wages are going to be life. They'll find out what they've been working for on payday. But unless they repent and get saved, they will find out too late. That is what Romans is trying to tell us. It's comparing, if I was to put it in more, more modern context, it is comparing slavery with bond servantship. Okay, it's comparing the two things. Now, this background I've given you also relates to chapter 7 with marriage. We're not talking about that tonight, but just bear these things in mind for when we get to chapter Seven. Okay. 
where a woman is bound, the wife is bound to her husband and so forth. Now, let's look. Verse 16, do you not know when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience? You are slaves to the one you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Let's talk about God's version of doing his will, keeping his commandments. Okay. In the Torah, God says in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, keep my commandments that it may be well with you. God wants it to be well with his people, and he wants it to be well with his children. <laughs> Keep my commandments that it may be well with you. God does not give us his commandments for our sake. God doesn't need us. He desires us, but he doesn't need us. We need him. He gives his commandments for our sake. Don't live in a moral life. The result is going to be death. I want it to be well with you. Now remember, we're going back now, contrasting the Torah as a legislation, the Deuteronomic legislation is the theological term, with other legal codes of the ancient world, such as the Code of Hammurabi being the most famous. Not only did Jews have higher standards of education that were mandatory literacy and mandatory numeracy, but they had higher standards of things like public health. The Levites would carry out medical inspections of people with leprosy. They would be quarantined. Leprosy devastated the ancient Near East. Devastated it. But if they kept the Torah, it wouldn't devastate the Hebrews. No refrigeration, no food processing. In that climate, things like trigonosis, botulism, If you avoided in that climate at that time shellfish and pork products, to this day, those kinds of foods are more associated statistically with botulism and trigonosis. Now, I'm not preaching seven day Adventism or mandatory kashrut or anything like that. We're not under the law, we're under grace. But it is notable that there would have been less occurrences of those diseases that were widespread, leprosy and these things, if they kept the law, the Torah, that it may be well with you, the quarantines and the rest of it. Remember, none of these diseases shall I put on you. Keep the law that it may be well with you. God wants us to do his will because it is in our interest to do so. The devil wants unsaved people to do his will because it is in his interest. God wants us to keep his commandments for our sake. The devil wants us to do his will for his sake. This is the contrast of Romans. You have to understand, again, Romans in light of the law, in light of the Torah.
Now let's look. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves, you were slaves, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. You went from being a slave to a bondservant. You went from slavery to freedom. Now, freedom does not mean you can do what you want without restriction. That's slave fruit. <laughs> People who live a wanton lifestyle, then an immoral lifestyle, they think they're free to live as they want. They, they are basically nihilists. They are hedonists. The people into total hedonism. Well, there's a payday for that. They're slaves, and there's a payday coming, and they'll get paid. Death will be their wage. Thinking themselves to be free. They are slaves, and they will find out on payday. With us, knowing ourselves to be bond servants, we know we are free, and a payday is coming unto life eternal, unto infinite blessing, to co-reigning with Christ. In other words, <clears throat> when we go back to Genesis 4 and we compare Genesis 4 to Romans 6, or when we look at Genesis 6 in light of Genesis 4, the Lord says, what a mess you've gotten yourself into. I told you not to do this. Listen to me. I've got to get you out of this. You got yourself into this. Trust me. I can get you out of it, but you got to listen to me. When I get you out of it, it'll be different. There'll be a millennial reign of Christ. There'll be eternal glory in heaven. It won't always be like this. But for now, I've got to get you out of this mess. You've got to do what I tell you. Otherwise, you never make it. That's what happens when we compare Romans 6 with Genesis 4. Let's continue. Having been freed from sin, verse 18, you become slaves as doulos of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. We all have an old nature and it is weak. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification, being set apart to God. Now notice what it says, impurity, a catharsis, and lawlessness, a nomos. <clears throat> lawlessness, flagrant Moral and criminal debauchery. The Antichrist will be the man of lawlessness. Accepts no law. <clears throat> they think they're a law unto themselves. But in fact, they're under the law of sin and death. <clears throat> the Torah indicts them. The Ten Commandments indicts them. Okay. Open reprobation. Open rebellion against God, open rejection. That is antinomianism. But then there is a catharsis, impurity. Impurity is a mixture. That's what it means, a mixture. What is the difference between sinning with impurity and sinning with Antinomianism. 
Somebody goes out and says, I'm going to sleep with all the women I can pick up in a pub or a bar or a, a discotheque, or I'm going to sleep with all the guys I can fancy, and, and, and that's it, and I'm going to just live that way. I'm going to live a lascivious lifestyle that is sexually uh, promiscuous. And I'm going to going to give myself over to sexual gratification without restraint. So I'm going to say that. And there's people like that. There's lots of people like that. Probably most of us were something like that. Unless you had the advantage of getting saved as a as a kid and growing up in a Christian family. But okay. That is antinomianism. There's nothing wrong with it because I say there's nothing wrong with it. I want to do it. <laughs> Would you want somebody to use your kid's sister as a sex object? No. Why are you using somebody else's kid sister as a sex object? But that's another issue. <clears throat> Related but different. But impurity? Well, we really do love each other and we plan on getting engaged when we finish college. So now I'm, I'm, we're going to take birth control and we're just going to sleep together as if we're already married, even though we're not married yet. We haven't entered into a marriage covenant. We're not engaged yet. We're going to wait till we finish college. We're just going to. We really are in love. Well, maybe they are. No, it is not antinomianism. But it is impurity. Impurity is there is a mixture of what is acceptable and unacceptable. What is right and what is wrong. What is good and what is bad. What is life and what is death. Nice people. Religious people. Upstanding citizens tend to sin by impurity. Out and out reprobates will tend to sin by antinomianism. It doesn't matter. The wages of sin is death. There's a mixture. Let's look. For when you were slaves of sin, in verse 20, before you were saved, you were free in regard to righteousness. Oh, don't tell me I can't get drunk. Don't tell me I can't sleep around or whatever it is. I'm free from that righteousness, as you define it. I have my own law. When people have their own law, it may have the pretense of certain moral values. Okay. But it's still a mixture. In other words, we might say fornication is wrong. But a lot of people who are fornicators would not engage in pedophilia. You understand? <laughs> Impurity will always have the pretense of some kind of morality because it's a mixture. <clears throat> a lot of fornicators wouldn't be pedophiles. Today, I went into the local supermarket called Waitrose. I'm not going in there again. I spit on the sign going in, like a lot of other businesses in Great Britain, and I suppose elsewhere, they're putting up the, the homosexual rainbow emblem, the flag. And be proud of what you are. You're supposed to be proud of something that is unnatural and perverse. I wanted to make a complaint, not that that would have done any good in Britain, particularly people would just think you're crazy. And they would think because you're against homosexuality, you're a bigot who's against homosexuals. <clears throat> but I decided I would give it a try anyway, just to voice my disapproval. 
that I'm having to walk by a sign promoting this in order to shop in this supermarket. And the person at the customer relations counter was a homosexual. <laughs> what are you going to do? Society has become so debased. It's become so debased. There's no moral base of it anymore. A homosexual is a serious, serious slave. Now, we deal with this on our teaching, or a lesbian, on our teaching, not even a minya. You can get it on our website. Remember when the angelic messengers struck the violent gang of homosexuals blind when they were trying to gang rape the angels who manifested in human form? And they were trying to gang rape them. And they were struck blind. Yet even in their blindness, even having been struck blind, even losing their eyesight, they kept continuing to find the door. We pointed this out before. They were so driven and possessed by an unnatural passion that even having lost their eyesight, they still wanted to fulfill the unnatural lust. A heterosexual, I don't care if it was Marilyn Monroe, they're not going to behave that way. You lose your eyesight, you want to get to a hospital, you want an ophthalmologist, you want something. They were so consumed by this unnatural. That is serious slavery. That is serious. Can you imagine losing your eyesight? And instead of wanting to get some kind of medical or clinical help or professional help, you, you, you're trying to... Oh, oh. That's a slave, man. And they think they're free to do it. How can that be free? Not to mention the medical ramifications of those lifestyles. Well, let's look. <clears throat> you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, in verse 21, what benefit were you then deriving from the things which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. I have friends who are dead from drugs. People I used to hang out with and get high with are dead from drugs. And I was more crazy than some of them. I took more drugs than some of them. I'm not just talking about marijuana. I'm talking about, my case was cocaine. I even injected cocaine. Never mind. I've got friends dead. Absolutely dead. And where are they now? Most probably, they're going to hell. The outcome of those things is death. Verse 22, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, I'm a bondservant. I used to be a slave, in other words. You derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. We're in the process of being sanctified. We all have a long way to go, especially guys like me. But the process, by the grace of God, is underway. For the wages of sin is death. That's payday. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, him in eternity. We're going to pick up our paycheck. One way or another, we're going to get the wages due us. Now, the wages I was due and the wages you would do. 
was death. The only thing is Jesus died in your place and in mine. He picked up the wages for what I did. So as a free gift, give me the wages to which I was not entitled, but only got because of his righteousness, not my own. What a deal. What a deal. If anybody understands the gospel, really understands it, you've got to be out of your mind to turn it down. You've got to be out of your mind to turn down a deal like that. But they're blind. They're in bondage. They're enslaved. That's the way it is. We are bond servants. And a reward, a wage is coming for our service to the one who saved us. But the wages of sin is death. Thank you, Jesus, that you picked up the paycheck to me, death. And more than that, you gave me the reward, do you, life? That is what Romans 6 is telling us.